Hi, this is Frederick Morgison, Eli Broad Professor of Management at Michigan State University and the editor of the Annual Review of Organizational Psychology and Organizational Behavior. Uh, today, I've got the good fortune to chat with Ed Shine, who wrote an article for our latest volume, Volume 2 of the Annual Review. Uh, Ed probably needs no introduction, but I'll give, him a I'll give a brief one to kind of highlight his major milestones and some of the things he's done over the course of his uh, long and illustrious co career. Uh, he received his PhD in 1952 from Harvard University in Social Psychology, and his first job was working for the Walter Reed Research Institute, working with veterans of the Korean War. And um, hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about some of that work because it's actually quite interesting. Following that, he joined the faculty at MIT in 1956, where he remained until 2005 uh, and retired. Uh, Ed has had a long and successful career. Uh, I think uh, we like to think of Ed as a, as a scholar, but he's also a writer, and he's written a number of books and important articles in the domain on the topics of leadership, culture, careers, socialization, and organizational development. So it's my great fortune to be able to chat with Ed, and I thank him for taking the time to talk with us today. So Ed, thanks for coming. And uh, I guess the first question that I think uh, we want to know about is, how did you get interested in a career in what we now call or organizational psychology uh, and organizational behavior? <laughs> That's an interesting question, because it happened in, in some unpredictable stages. Uh, at the University of Chicago as an undergraduate, I spent three years not knowing what I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But in the biology course, we ran into someone who was just starting out called Carl Rogers. Mm, okay. And we, we had a great time mimicking each other because we thought that was very funny. But it got me into psychology at Stanford, and I became very interested in experimental social because mm. that was the time when Ash and all those people were doing those very important experiments right. on social influence. Then when I got to Harvard, uh, I broadened because uh, I learned something about anthropology and sociology. But even then, was going to be just an experimental social psychologist until I got an offer from MIT Sloan School and I knew nothing about management, nothing about organizations, but I loved Cambridge, <laughs> and Doug McGregor was very persuasive. Okay. So by going to the Sloan School, that's how I got committed to organizations. Interesting. So were there significant sort of people or events that sort of propelled you kind of early on in your career? Absolutely. While I was still at Harvard, Kurt Lewin had created his group dynamic center at MIT, and one of the most strong influences was one of his first students, Alex Bavilis, who was doing with Hal Levitt his classical network experiments in the basement of the Sloan School building, and I had taken a course with Bavilis and just loved that whole experimental approach. Uh, and it reinforced the experimental side of me. Mm -hmm. But then when I got into the Army and got involved with the Korean POWs, I realized there's there's more to research than just doing experiments. Right, <laughs> right, right. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. I think you write about it a little bit in your article, but it's it, I think it's very interesting, and it looks to me like it shaped a lot of what you subsequently chose to study. Well, I was in the... Army clinical psychology program, partly because it was a way of being a, avoiding the draft, mm -hmm. but that meant three years of payback. Mm -hmm. And I was very fortunate, I think, to be sent to Walter Reed Institute of Research because that was a very good research-oriented lab. Mm -hmm. And it just was happenstance that the Korean War was over and there was going to be a big exchange of prisoners. Mm -hmm. And so the military brought all its psychologists, social workers, and psychiatrists, put them into teams, sent them to Korea to get on board a ship mm. to debrief the repatriates because there was this feeling that something different had happened, right. which got labeled brainwashing. Different from earlier conflicts, I guess. Different from the Russian Pavlovian okay. interrogator gotcha. model. Gotcha. We knew all about interrogation and communists and so on, mm -hmm. but it felt different in China. They, okay. they were doing something different. Mm. And so 
my ship was delayed for three weeks, so I set up shop and started to interview mm -hmm. repatriates as they came off the trucks and discovered that it was really a social psychology story. It was an influence, hmm. a group influence type of thing rather than the uh, the magic interrogator who somehow managed right. by reasoning to get you to confess to things. The Chinese were very enthusiastic at that point about their new communism. And some of the reason why prisoners paid attention is because of the enthusiasm of the captor rather hmm. than the, the big evil hypnotist <laughs> doing things. Sure. So my first article, which really got much more press than my first experimental article was just to describe uh, what this Chinese prison program was mm -hmm. in very social psychological terms. 